Welcome back to Everyman Academy. So glad to be back. Thank you all for listening. Everyman Academy is proudly part of the Just Three Murphs podcasting network. Class is now in session. Today, we will be discussing Gulliver's Travels. This book was written by Jonathan Swift in the year 1726. Gulliver's Travels cannot be considered without some historical context. Swift wrote this masterpiece of satire under a pseudonym. Many moments in Gulliver's Travels are allusions to the politics of the day, but his allegiances are hard to pin down. What we do know is he was greatly impacted by the injustice dealt to the Irish at the hands of the English nobility. He famously wrote in support of the Irish people. His words would spread through common halls and taverns. He often wrote in critique of scientism and favor classical education and the study of the ancients. In the time of Enlightenment philosophy, moving forward with logic, reason, and humanism, he was outspoken about the limits in these new ways of thought. He also had a dirty sense of humor which conflicts with a pious moralism you'd expect from a Christian man of religion. I spent a lot of time researching this episode and went down some major rabbit holes. Through the 17th and 18th centuries, there's a lot going on in Europe. After countless hours of study, I have come to the conclusion it is best to stick with the story that has endured after these political struggles have been largely forgotten. Gulliver's Travels has survived throughout the ages, most recently depicted in a modern film adaptation starring Jack Black. In 1726, gone were the days of medieval life. We are now well into the Age of Discovery or the Age of Conquest where European empires expanded through exploration of the New World, making first contact with indigenous cultures separated by a once unchartable oceanic abyss. These are the early days of globalization, where superior military prowess tactics and technology literally blew away the competition. The brutality of colonization. The reality of these struggles, we look back with horror and shame. European imperialism further perpetuated the spread of Western civilization. These were the days of large seafaring vessels, of navigation, and of pirates. Ahoy there, matey! For all the horrific realities of this time, there also remains a certain romanticism. In the era of Google Maps, where every last corner of the globe has been digitized, satellite tracked, and charted to peruse at your fingertips, we can get lost imagining a world without limitation. The potential for discovery on the horizon. The existence of unexplored parts of the world. These were the times of Lemuel Gulliver. His story is told through his perspective, a diary of sorts addressed to us, the reader. The story is told in four distinct parts. In part one, we meet Gulliver. He talks of beginning his journey. He is an Englishman who is on a sea voyage to establish himself, discover wealth, record his findings along the way. In not too long, he encounters a violent storm. Tossed, thrashing amidst the violent waves, he's cast overboard and washed ashore. Growing increasingly weary, he lays down in the grass and falls asleep. I slept sounder than I ever remember to have done in my life. I attempted to rise, but was not able to stir, for as I happened to lie on my back, I found my arms and legs were strongly fastened on each side to the ground, and my hair, which was long and thick, tied down in the same manner. I likewise felt several slender lingatures across my body from my armpits to my thighs. I could only look upwards. The sun began to grow hot and the light offended mine eyes. I heard a confused noise about me, but in the posture I lay could see nothing except the sky. In a little time I felt something alive moving on my left leg, which advanced gently forward over my breast, came almost up to my chin. When bending my eyes downward as much as I could, I perceived it to be a human creature not six inches high, with a bow and arrow in his hands and a quiver in his back. In the meantime, I felt at least forty or more of the same kind as I conjectured, 
Following the first, I was in the utmost astonishment and roared so loud that they all ran back in a fright, and some of them, as I afterwards were told, were hurt with the falls they got from leaping from my sides upon the ground. However, they soon returned, and one of them, who ventured as far as to get a full sight of my face, lifting up my hands and eyes by the way of admiration. Here we are, the famous scene we know so well. Gulliver finds himself tied down, a giant among the Lilliputians. The way in which this scene unfolds, we can identify with Gulliver's confusion and also imagine the horror that is being inflicted upon this group of miniature humans. With all their architectural sophistication of Europeans, they are rendered powerless to the size of poor Gulliver. He is attacked and shot with arrows, faced with their feeble attempts at hand-to-hand -hand combat. After some confusion and general discomfort, Gulliver is eventually able to negotiate a ceasefire. Friendly relations persist, and the inhabitants of Lilliput go to great lengths to provide shelter. They exhaust their food stores to feed him and fight amongst themselves with a giant in their mists. They call him Mountain Man, and eventually Quinbis Flestrin. They risk famine to feed him, and they invite him into their massive city. Grant him an audience at the king's court. One of the most memorable scenes makes its way into every movie adaptation. When a fire breaks out in the city capital, Gulliver, in all his glory, provides the means of extinguishment. Kind of a crass, lowbrow sort of image. Hilarious, nonetheless, to imagine the perspective of the tiny Lilliputians in a crowded city block flooded with a torrent of urine from above. Not to mention the other implications that easily come into view. I'll let you use your imagination. Lilliputians are prideful people. Gulliver is fascinated by their laws and customs. They are a society that follows the laws of justice, crime, and punishment. They have a strongly held sense of morality as well as obedience. They uphold their rule of law through a use of rewards encouraging civility. The inhabitants of Lilliput are nationalistic. They work together, but individualism and accountability for one's actions remain intact. Ultimately, though, behind their espoused virtues, values, and philosophies lie schemes and political maneuvering. Gulliver is caught in the strife between neighboring kingdom of Blefuscu and wrongfully accused of treason. Quite literally, his larger-than-life presence in Lilliput is too much of a threat, and he strides off into the sunset naked as the day he was born. A final moment of provocative indecency for these tiny humans to behold. Gulliver is saved through a rapid series of events, brought aboard an English vessel, and returns home. You would think being stranded in a bizarre and mysterious land would be enough for Gulliver to settle down, but in no time at all, he's off again to seek his fortune, and wouldn't you have it, another storm and remote landfall later, Gulliver finds himself alone again, this time a little person among giants. Once again, our perspective changes. In the voyage of part two, Gulliver is in the kingdom of Brobdignag. Here the inhabitants are gentle giants, and after Gulliver is discovered and marveled at for a bit, he is taken care of by the daughter of a farmer's maid. This book is so steeped in the perspective of Gulliver, there's not really much room for other characters to become fully fleshed out or come into view with their own distinct identity. They feel removed, perhaps a reflection of Gulliver's scientific view of the world. He is a surgeon by trade and anthropological in his analysis of culture. One character stands out among the rest, though, and that is the daughter of the farmer's maid. This innocent child cares for him like a pet, and we sense Gulliver's vulnerability as a man six inches high, and he graciously accepts her comfort and care. For fellow 90s kids, mental comparisons to the 1989 film Honey, I Shrunk the Kids are inevitable. While Gulliver was unreserved and uninhibited in part one, he meets an enlarged perspective of human flesh with shock and revulsion in part two. The nurse to quiet her babe made use of a rattle, which was a kind of hollow vessel filled with great stones and fastened by a cable to the child's waist, but all in vain, so that she was forced to apply the last remedy by giving it suck. I must confess, 
No object ever disgusted me so much as the sight of a monstrous breast, which I cannot tell what to compare with so as to give the curious reader an idea of its bulk, shape, and color. It stood prominent six foot and could not be less than sixteen in circumference. The nipple was about half the bigness of my head, and the hue of both that and the dung so verified with spots, pimples, and freckles that nothing could appear more nauseous, for I had a near sight of her, she sitting down the more conveniently to give suck, and I standing on the table. This made me reflect upon the fair skins of our English ladies, who appear so beautiful to us only because they are their own size and their defects not to be seen but through a magnifying glass. The mind of Mr. Gulliver. <laughs> anyway. The value of this tiny man is easily understood by the farmer who brings Gulliver to the metropolis of Brobdignag, where he impresses the queen. Once again, Gulliver is embraced by the royalty of a foreign land and we get to learn another unique form of government in their rule. The kingdom of Brobdignag is gentle and humane compared to Lilliput. The king is shocked about England's history, especially when it comes to political intrigue and warfare. Their life is simple. The highest positions of prestige occupied by farmers and those who provide a practical and necessary public good. They avoid abstract philosophy, and Gulliver looks down on that, sticking up his nose due to their lack of knowledge expansion and desire to increase their intellect. Development of technology and progress are not priorities for the giants of this land. In part two, Gulliver's story wraps up even quicker than in part one, and when he returns again to England, this time he is confused and disoriented. Being confronted with his native world of normal proportions is strange to him, and we begin to see that his time spent away is having an effect on him. He's changing. Now, wouldn't you have it, once again, no time at all? He grows restless and naively sets out for another journey. Maybe this time, it will be different. Part 3 switches things up quite a bit, as his travels are more of little excursions into several different lands. Swift's writing becomes looser, the settings are tougher to visualize, but the ideas conveyed provoke complex thought. We move into deeply philosophical territory where the political illusions and satirical nature of this story takes center stage. In Laputa, we see a floating island setting. The people of this kingdom are obsessed with mathematics, scientific advancement, and music at the cost of all else. They deify these disciplines to an absurd degree. Their quest for perfection in all aspects of life has horrible consequences for the greater population, the common folk. In Lugnag, Gulliver discovers the horrors of immortality, their ruling class condemned to an eternity of decrepit old age. It seems the fountain of youth may not be so alluring after all. My favorite of these smaller adventures we find in part three in the voyage into Glub Dub Drib, where we encounter references to the Western canon. The inhabitants of Glub Dub Drib are sorcerers and magicians that possess the ability to conjure past figures of legend and history. It's almost as if they have some sort of magical on-demand streaming service. Gulliver quickly fills his wish list with Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Socrates, the epic poet Homer, and countless others that appear before his eyes. The truth is exposed, revealed before him in all its fullness through a whirlwind of wizardry. He learns that reality is often much different than what was written down all those years ago. Gulliver's romanticism for the past is obliterated and he grows disillusioned after taking the red pill and traveling down a rabbit hole of conspiracy and mystery. I found how the world had been misled by prostitute writers to ascribe the greatest exploits in war to cowards, the wisest counsel to fools, sincerity to flatterers, Roman virtue to betrayers of their country, piety to atheists, chastity to sodomites, truth to informers, how many innocent and excellent persons had been condemned to death or banishment by the practicing of their great ministers upon the corruption of judges and malice of their faction, how many villains had been exalted to the highest places of trust, power, dignity, and profit, how great a share in the motions and events of courts, councils, and senates might be challenged by bards, whores, pimps, parasites, and buffoons. How low an opinion I had of human wisdom and integrity. 
when I was truly informed of the springs and motives of greater enterprises and revolutions in the world, and of the contemptible accidents to which they owed their success. Jonathan Swift had his share of inside knowledge, brushes with nobles and elite aristocracy, even King William III himself. What did he know that led to write Gulliver's travels and his excursion into antiquity revealed to him by the sorcerers of Glub Dub Drib? We may never know. Last but not least, one final journey. Part 4 is a bit of a course correction. We're back into the traditional storytelling of parts 1 and 2. We learn of the land of the Honohems, horse people who follow the guidance of logic and reason, no matter where it leads. These Honohems have successfully rationalized the subjugation of an entire race of humanoids known as the Yahoos. These horse people have found in their intellect justification for enslavement Gulliver agrees with them and is so impressed with the philosophical fortitude of these horsemen, he becomes a sort of devotee and follower of their way of life. Throughout history, we know the horrors of colonialism. Rulers will justify atrocity. They've done so from the Bronze Age right into the 20th century. It's hard not to reflect on the dark side of humanity when reading Gulliver's travels, especially with his experience with the Honohims. After all these travels, through all four parts, Gulliver returns home, once a proud Englishman, searched for meaning, fortune, discovery. He is disgusted by his own wife and children, shoulders a deep hatred for humanity. Gulliver is a fool. Jonathan Swift cleverly shows us these travels from Gulliver's perspective. We are drawn in as he is breaking the fourth wall, talking to us, the reader, directly. How are we supposed to view him? Well, it's not such a simple answer. Jonathan Swift, at times, talks to us directly through Gulliver. At other times, he plays with the character's actions to embed his message in a more subtle, thought-provoking, and indirect way. This satire contains ambiguity and will continue to be the topic of much discussion and debate for many years to come. The story of Gulliver's travels has endured far beyond many of the contemporary political struggles of its time. Clearly, this is so much more than a political satire for the 18th century. It is a critique of humanity, philosophy, humanism, scientism, and the foolishness of man to think he will ever be anything greater than imperfection. When Gulliver arrives in new lands among strange and different beings, he seeks to learn from them. In part one, he hopes for liberty and misses home. After part four, he's repulsed by his home country of England and hates everyone he ever loved. We laugh at his ignorance. He carries along with civilized airs as he barbarically urinates on an entire metropolis. In his boyish glee, there is little empathy for the tremendous impact down below. The little people of Lilliput are proud and headstrong. An entire population with a Napoleon complex nearly a century before he would go on to conquer most of Europe. In part two, Gulliver is brought down to size. His smallness and stature and worldview become clear through his disgust and repulsion of the human form magnetized. He feels no shame in his contempt. Any version of a quote-unquote other is strange and alien to him. The larger-than-life Brobdignagians display a gentle kindness, a virtuous innocence, yet they are out of touch with the hard truths in the world. Gulliver is very flawed, and each in their own way, so too are the peoples with whom he meets through his many voyages. In part three, Jonathan Swift jumps from one place to the next. The story becomes topsy-turvy and we perform mental gymnastics to conceive each altered perspective given. Gulliver's disorientation and personal transformation now begins to set in. All written in a simplistic yet effective style, the reader maintains detachment from the fantastical settings that Gulliver finds himself in. This story is easily absorbed, humorous and effective as a satire. Gulliver and his many travels and all their outrageous ways become real to us in our imagination. Jonathan Swift was a man of the church and spoke in defense of Christian theology and worldview during his day. Yet, bodily functions and grotesque imagery are often depicted throughout the story, a moral contradiction that can't help but shine through. 
During Swift's time, humanism, the philosophy that centers on the human experience of the individual, sprang forth as a secular worldview. Can't help but feel that Swift is telling us the flaws of this philosophy through Gulliver's fate. Look what happens when the nature of the divine is stripped away from the way we view our lives. What are the benefits we experience when we see our lives handed down to us, bestowed by a benevolent higher power? What are the benefits of a radical acceptance of human imperfection? Maybe we can see the answers when we look at Gulliver. He does possess a sense of goodness, but his scientific rationalism guides his opinion of others with a detachment, lacking empathy, with a hubris and elitism. He remains self-important and unaffected by the reality of human nature. He does not accept the negative parts of humanity. He rejects them, perhaps in a subconscious pursuit of perfection. He becomes disillusioned when his worldly attachments to the legends of history are smashed to pieces by the magicians in part three. Ultimately, by the end, he is transformed from aloof optimist to bitter curmudgeon, the ultimate hater, even of his own flesh and blood. Is this the destiny on the road to progress for secular man? To experience the fullness of life, we must accept our limitations. Can we strive for good while accepting that ugliness will always exist? I empathize with Gulliver and his hopes, his pursuit for justice and good. Sadly, his over-reliance on the intellect and knowledge leads him to end up a ruined man. An important lesson. I feel like I've been to the ends of Earth and back. Gulliver's Travels is not a long read, but it may take a lifetime to fully understand. You can take it at its surface through a modern lens, or go in deeper and be confronted with a complexity of historical truth. If you are interested in learning more about these times, go to everymanacademy.com and check out my blog post about the glorious revolution of 1688 in England, and I am officially now on Reddit. My username is Professor underscore JT. I've been loving the discussion going on. Come find me. Next episode, we're going to be discussing pride and prejudice. I'm ready to embrace some lighter fare and enter the world of the romance novel. Get swept off your feet and join me for perhaps the most satisfying love story of all time as we get a taste for the finer things in life. So, until next time, this has been another episode of Everyman Academy. Class dismissed.